We're just so happy to have all of you so very much. And those of you, the television around the world, wherever you may be, we are very happy to have you join us. And I hope you can stay for the entirety of the program. I think it'll be a blessing to you. We're going to be studying Armageddon, the most horrifying conflict that the world will have ever known, and it's seen some bad ones. And um, it is not far away, but thank God every child of God is going to be with the Lord. And somebody said, well, we believe we're going to have to go through the Great Tribulation and the Battle of Armageddon. Well, ask the Lord. He said, ask whatever you want, and he'll give it to you. <laughs> but, Mike, I don't want to go. I don't want to go either. You know, I did have somebody ask me that once. They said, if I ask, do you think that the Lord will let me stay and go through it? No. And I asked him, I said, why? He said, because they're going to need teachers. <laughs> and I thought to myself, no, God will raise up the teachers. I still want to go in the rapture. Right, yeah, right. Okay, we'll pick up with the first verse of the 38th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. Go ahead, Don, if you will. Well, you didn't tell me until now, so I've got to turn to it. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Gog is another name for the Antichrist. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. For many years, Bible teachers have thought that these passages refer to Russia, but a closer investigation of these statements prove otherwise. Therefore, the phrase, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, is not referring to Russia, but instead to the Antichrist. And I will turn you back and put hooks into your jaws. And I will bring you forth and all of your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. This prophecy refers to the Battle of Armageddon, which will be the second invasion by the Antichrist of Israel, in which he will be totally destroyed. The first invasion will take place in the midst of of the Great Tribulation, when the Antichrist will then show his true colors. I want to ask the panel a question as we begin tonight. Um, it's the Jewish question. Whenever we saw the situation which took place, was it October 7th? Yes. And the horror of that, I've never seen anything like it in my life, and neither have you. And um, the, the, the torture that these people went through, the Jews, <clears throat> the pain they suffered of losing little babies on up to adults and whatever the case. But then it was almost like it was worse whenever our streets were filled with tens of thousands of students, of older people or whatever the case, opposing Israel and blaspheming her, laughing about it, claiming this is what they deserved. The question I ask is, why the animosity? Israel is, is about the most peace-seeking people in the world. They are not warlike. Now, the Lord has helped them to win every war since becoming a nation in 1948, but they were attacked. They were not the instigator. They were attacked. I remember being in Israel once, and at an intersection in northern Israel, I believe it was, <clears throat> there was a tank there. And I asked the guy, what, what is that tank? It was oh, an old tank. It was not a new one, an old one. And uh, it was, had been blasted apart. He said, Brother Swaggart, that is 
as far as the Egyptian army right here is as far as they were able to go when they tried to destroy us. So, why this animosity? Why this hatred in the face of, of terrible, horrible uh, bloodletting that these people experienced a few weeks ago? Why do you all think that the animosity is so rampant. I think that the uh, rise of <clears throat> anti-Semitism around the world is all, you know, demonically inspired. I think that what's being right, taught in right. universities and even taught in some churches and some seminaries is all part of just increased persecution of the Jews as we get closer to the coming of the Lord. I think it's, um, they don't realize it, but it's our hatred for Jesus Christ. That's, they that's they right. would not be able to say that. I mean, they wouldn't think to say that, but that's the reality. They right. hate yeah. Christ. They hate the Bible. They hate Christians. They hate the church. That's it. And they think that their anger is directed toward Israel because they say they're an apartheid state or whatever the case may be. But really, it's because they hate Jesus Christ. When you look through history, from the very founding of the nation of Israel, they have had to fight for their very existence. And then you go through, even with when Rome destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 70. Titus. And then you go up through when Hitler tried to annihilate the Jews. The Jews were God's people. And prophetically, when we look at the book of Revelation, they are God's timepiece. Right. That is how God measures time. Prophecy. And so the enemy's doing everything he can to destroy them. You saw that when Pharaoh tried to destroy the Egyptian babies, when Moses was born. We saw it when Herod had the Hebrew children killed, when Jesus was born. So it's not something that's come up lately. It's something that has occurred through history. And the people that are doing their revolt in the streets are those who are listening to the spirit of Antichrist. They're listening and they're being deceived. Right. Oh, yes, that's exactly right. It's deception. <clears throat> the spirit of deception. It's just yes. not mere deception. It's empowered by the powers of darkness. And... Um, but what's really sad is that you have Christians that are siding with them. Nominal, really? You've got nominal Christians that are taking the replacement uh, theory. The, 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 Let's say that again. You're telling me that uh, and telling our audience that um, Christians? There are Christians that feel that, that uh, the book of Revelation is not an issue. There are Christians who feel in replacement theology. There are Christians who feel that Israel doesn't matter anymore that God has forsaken them, that this is part of the, could I say, judgment upon them for, for refusing Jesus Christ. Your, your Calvinists do not believe in Israel. Reformed theology says that Israel is over. God does not care about them anymore. They're not, I heard, our, I listened to a round table, some of the biggest names in Reformed theology, and they just was just like, it doesn't matter. They're, Israel doesn't exist. They, they believe that modern Israel has nothing to do with biblical Israel. Uh, they believe in what's called preterism, that the events of the end times have already happened in A.D. 70 with the siege of Jerusalem. Preterism is a Latin term. It means past or beyond. So they, they don't, you know, in the late 1800s, the uh, professors, people like John Nelson Darby, C.I. Schofield, Lewis Sperry Schaefer, in their, into the early 1900s, they began to teach dispensationalism, and it went against the popular teaching of the time, but they began to point out that God's revelation to man over time, they divided it up into different dispensations, and they believed that uh, the church had not replaced uh, Israel, that Israel had a separate 
plan that God was going to unfold in the end times. And they began to popularize the dispensational teaching. And dispensationalism directly affected American political I mean, it influenced American political involvement, but these gentlemen lived before the time of the formation of the nation of Israel. But uh, up to that point, everyone said the church replaced Israel and that it's supersessionism, like Brother Mike pointed out. But, uh, you know, so the original dispensationalism that was popularized at places like Dallas Theological Seminary, later Pentecostal teachers began to take those teachings and make more of a Pentecostal version because the original dispensationalists didn't believe in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the continuationist outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So then we had guys like uh, Dake and John G. Hall and some of these other uh, preachers that began to to, uh, teach this form of dispensationalism that we would identify with. So because America supported Israel politically. Now, officially, they said it was because Israel was the only democracy in the area, so they were going to support them, but it was influenced religiously. It was influenced because of this dispensational teaching, and so you see during this time and this support of Israel, you see America prospering, growing. America did have hard times, but post-World War II, they built the greatest economy the world had seen. I mean, the Lord blessed our nation directly because of our support of Israel. When you look at the right, great, right. when you look at nations over the years who have who have turned against Israel, there was a time when the British Empire, the sun never set on the British Empire, but because of their, uh, you know, their anti-Semitism and their rejection of Israel, the Lord took that away from them. And so now we are at a place in America where universities, even theologians, even pastors who are preaching that modern Israel has nothing to do with biblical Israel and losing that support of the nation of Israel, we are going to reap that in this country. It's going to affect us in a negative way. It already has our administration, our those that are coming up. Like you said, for young people to wave Palestinian flags and to call Israel the uh, aggressors and the occupiers and to try to turn everything on them, it's, it's all a spirit of Antichrist. It's all a demonic spirit. But we, when we lose our support of Israel, whether it be politically motivated or motivated by the idea of dispensational teaching that the church did not replace Israel, in God's plan here. Now, obviously, everybody has to come through Christ to get to God. There's no, we're not saying that, but we're saying that God does have a specific timetable in his, uh, in his timeline for what's going to happen with the nation of Israel. So we as a church, we have to support, we have to pray for Jerusalem, we have to support Israel, but we've got to understand it in the proper context that the events of this time that we're seeing in Ezekiel and Daniel in Revelation, these events are events that are to come, not events that have passed. So the, in my opinion, the doctrine of preterism or partial preterism is not a scriptural doctrine, but that's what's popular in the Reformed camp. That these and that things means? Are, the, the preterism means that these things have already passed, that these events have happened like in A.D. 70 with the siege of Jerusalem. That's what... Uh, When Brother Donnie's talking about the Reformed camp, they don't believe in dispensationalism. They believe in what they call covenantalism and that, uh, you know, God's plan reverted to the church instead of Israel, that after Christ was crucified, it became just about the church and and not about the nation of Israel. Well, America's position regarding Israel, I'm talking about our political leaders, it has a whole lot to do with the n- number of Christians in this nation who stand up for Israel. And as that weakens, the political aspect will weaken as well. And um, as the church grows cold or lukewarm either one, that will tell in respect to the support of Israel by the political leaders. The- Let me go back to your original question and speak to that. 
Um, I was shocked as well concerning the hundreds of young people in the streets railing against Israel. And, and I prayed about that and I sought the Lord about it. I think what we're seeing is not just an anti-Israel spirit, but it is an anti-Christian spirit as well. I think yes. the Prime Minister yes. Netanyahu, he says that they, they claim that Israel is the little Satan and that we're the big Satan. The world, by and large, still sees us as a Christian nation. And as I, as I watch the television and I listen to the people and I've studied about the growth of atheism and what's going on on the streets, there is definitely an anti-Christian spirit that's bleeding back and forth in terms of Israel and America. And sad to say, many of these people are against the evangelical church and they're, they are against the church very strongly. It's, no, it's not mild, very strong feelings. And, and I've read enough about it, I've heard enough about it. And if we lived among some of these universities, we'd all feel it very strongly as well. But we are, we're in a difficult time these days and we're part of the problem as Christians. And they would like for the, the influence of Christians to be totally diminished, particularly in the, in the political realm. When I was in a liberal seminary, the liberal seminary didn't believe any of the things that we believe about the Bible and about the end times. And they, they, are, they were not at all interested in Israel either any more than they would be any other nation. And the, the, the fact that evangelicals want to emphasize it and, and really speak, to, uh, speak about Israel with respect and honor, they, they don't understand that. But we're in the last days and it's part of that which is preparing for the coming of the Lord. Exactly, right. And um, it can only get better as, as the church gets closer to the Lord. But things are becoming so blatant. Uh, it's, uh, it's not just anti-Christian, it's anti-God. The world hates God. And we're seeing a manifestation of that. We're seeing Hamas has proposed in the last few days a total uh, end of all hostility from Israel in order to get the hostages back and so forth. And I, unfortunately, I think the United States has already begun to put pressure oh, yes, on yes, Israel right. uh, to do that very thing right. uh, of not uh, wanting to take over the control of uh, Gaza and the uh, other parts of Israel that are controlled by the Palestinians. They're in insisting that they be controlled by the Palestinians, which is totally anti-Israel. They want to destroy. The only way that they consider peace is when Israel is destroyed. See, they have, they have openly said, you all know that, and the whole world knows it that we're going to do this again. Next time we'll be more rabid than we were this time. And any kind of a stop of hostility against them is going to just let them rebuild and rearm so they yeah. can do that exact thing. Brother Swagger, uh, the Jerusalem Post, this is today's reading on it. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu made this comment. He was talking to a reporter and the reporter said, are you going to refuse the deal? And and. Netanyahu turned to him and said, even you would refuse this deal. And here's the deal. What they're saying is, is that they're demanding a permanent ceasefire, number one, an IDF withdrawal from Gaza, number two, the release of all terrorists jailed for killing Israelis. There's nothing in here for Israel. There's nothing at all. And basically what they're saying is, would you please lay down your guns so we could shoot you? And that's how, basically what they're asking for. How strong is the White House pushing for that very thing? Well, that's, that's the problem is, is that we're getting mixed messages from, from our politicians. And, and I'm concerned because some of us have talked about this before, that we don't see America in the Bible in the last days. So something has to weaken us. Is this going to be the weakening that we don't support Israel anymore? 
is this is going to take America and weaken us so that we don't have the influence in the Middle East that we do right now. I'm, I'm looking at, and, and I, I'm not a, a, a military genius at all, but I was wondering where we, we sell them the weapons that protect themselves. If, if we decide not to sell them the weapons, where's Israel going to get the weapons? Good question. Yeah. How much of the uh, uh, bullets and missiles are they using right now? And what is their stockpile? It, again, my mind's just wondering about this, is how long Israel could, could sustain if America doesn't help them? Not long. Yeah, in this proposed uh, border deal that they've been trying to get passed, which is a farce, but in that border deal is, is as money for aid for Ukraine and Israel. And here to show you the emphasis, $60 billion for Ukraine, $13 billion for Israel. Mm. So that shows you right there that, that, that we are not doing our best to help Israel in this war. And, and, you know, I'm all for Ukraine, you know, uh, I don't, they have the right to defend themselves, but we can't keep giving this country billions of dollars and we don't know how it's being used. Right. Yeah. We already, we already know that the last three shipments of military hardware that we sent over there, half of it was found on the black market, literally stolen and sold. And a lot of that weaponry wound up in the hands of Hamas. So it's a, it's it's a, it's it's. But yet we're st just funneling money to Ukraine. Borrowed money at that. Well, we're just printing it. Yeah. We're just printing it. We don't have it. We're just printing it. But the point I'm being, when you see 60 billion for them and 13 billion for Israel, that says something. That that, that makes the statement. You know that that says it all. But I want to go back to thing on three. The vast majority of Pentecostals and Charismatics support Israel. Matter of fact, the, 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 the strength of the, the support of the church for Israel is 80% from Pentecostal and Charismatics. We are the ones holding firm oh, I'd say that's for right. the support yeah. of Israel. Right. And because we believe the Bible correctly. But these people really don't care about Israel. These, they don't really care. They, they, I heard them say with my own ears, well, they don't matter. They're in rebellion. They just don't matter. We are Israel. That's what they teach, that we, the church, is Israel. So, when you, so that's why you, in, in, in the non-Pentecostal circle, there is more anti-Israel spirit. But I, I'm so glad as a Pentecostal, that we, by and large, Pentecostals and Charismatics, are the strongest standing in support for Israel. That's true. That's true, yes. When I was, uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, someone wanted me to watch a documentary that was made by a filmmaker, and it was showing the Pentecostals in, the Palestine, in Palestine and the Gaza Strip and people who claim to be Pentecostals and look at what's going on with them, look at how they're living, look how they're being treated. It was a, a piece that was put out there to try to make Israel look, try to turn some of that support away from Israel and toward the Palestinians. So there is a, a movement of people who are trying to actively push that and, and show that it was I mean, the conditions that these people were living in is because of Hamas and because of uh, these different groups that have that have kept them that way. But uh, you know, well, I've seen I've seen three clips. The major me news media won't show it, but on Breitbart and Blaze, whatever. But they're going in news crews going into Gaza and interviewing Palestinians, and there are warning Israel to win. Yeah. Yeah. I heard one, one, and I, I don't remember the exact statement of this, the Palestinian they were interviewing on the street. He said, I want them to kill them all. He said, they don't, they don't care for us. That's true. Too. They starve us. We don't have anything because of them. We send billions of dollars to Palestine. The big so, tunnels. It's, well, not only that, but, you know, the, the leadership steals all the money so they can go live in Qatar and, and Dubai in mansions and you know and one's worth 
the three leaders, one's worth five billion, the second one's worth four and a half billion, and the poor one is only worth three billion. He's the poor one. He's the poor one. But that money is stolen money that they have stolen from the UN, from America, that was given to build hospitals, to build uh, streets, roads, to, to yeah. roads, to 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 uh, help the people, the Palestinian people. Right. And so, but we've got to understand too. There is a difference between Hamas and the the Palestinian people. Now, most of the Palestinian people hate Israel. That's just a fact. But those that are under the control of Hamas, you will find them more supportive of Israel than you will Hamas. And another thing the media won't report, in the, in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, there are Palestinians fighting to liberate Gaza. They are Palestinian, but they have freely joined the Israeli army and they are in 100% support of what Israel's trying to do. As I heard one being interviewed, he said, because they don't care. But the media here won't tell you that. They won't, they won't allow that to go across television. Well, is the media pro-Israel or anti-Israel? Anti. Oh, absolutely. Anti. Now, you've got... You've got a columnist here, a reporter here, but as an institution outside of conservatives like Breitbart or Blaze, even Fox, they're not pro-Israel. Some of them are, but there's just enough, just as much of them on Fox that are, they're, they don't really care one way or the other. You know, here's, here's a pattern we've seen for decades. Uh, Israel is attacked. Israel responds, it's the response that the media will talk about, not the initial attack. I'll give you an example. In 2018, I was in Israel for, for 10 days and just had a great tour. I love Israel. And uh, they bombed, one early morning, they bombed a school, an Israeli school. They bombed it before anybody got there. And so what they were hoping for was that Israel would retaliate and then they can put it all over the news. Hey, we, we attacked an empty building. What are you doing? about? And Israel was smart enough not to do that. But while we were there, they had a special meeting in the Knesset. And what they were talking about was, well, we've had enough. Let's go to war. And let's expand our border another 30 miles. And, and it almost went to war, and they didn't do it, thank goodness. But that's the pattern we've seen so many times, is that Israel gets attacked, and when it tries to retaliate and defend itself, they're the bad guys. And that's what happened this time. But October 7th, the pictures were so clear on the Internet. The, what, what happened, what, what Hamas did was so wicked that, that you've got people that, and, and I don't know how many that are on the border that were now saying, listen, they do have a right to defend themselves. That's what I'm saying. But the yeah. world, the world, told him to stand down. Well, Mr. Biden's doing that, isn't he? <coughs> Donnie, I'm glad that you pointed out that there is a difference between the Palestinians and Hamas. Yeah. yeah. Because the media does not make a distinction. To the media, it's all the same. Now, unfortunately, the Palestinians in America. They, they're not that way. They're hostile. Correct. Yes. They're, they're enemies to Israel, and they're enemies to us. Right. They're not our friend. And the vast majority, I'm convinced, of those who are protesting in the United States do not realize what their lives would be like if they were under Muslim rule. The rules... Well, most of your Palestinians, as, as, as you go to the camp, I saw interviews on campus, they're Palestinians that by and large were born here. They've never been. Yes. And so they are screaming against Israel, but yet themselves, they've never seen what Hamas does. And they don't understand what Shia law would do if it was implemented. Talking about Muslim law? Yeah. Muslim law. Shia, 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 <coughs> right. Shia, Shia right. law. Right. Uh, read again, down to the fourth verse, if you will, please. And I will turn you back and put hooks into your jaws. And I will bring you forth and all of your army, horses and horsemen, 
all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Many may ask the question, in the battle of Armageddon, will they fight with bucklers and shields and things of that nature? No, no, no. And the Holy Spirit had the writer, in this case Ezekiel, to write what he did need. All the, the Old or New Testament it makes no difference. Because if they had put modern weaponry, the names in there, the Holy Spirit could have done that. But uh, you can imagine what scholars would try to do, trying to dissect what an F-18 is <laughs> or uh, a bazooka or whatever the case. And uh, so they, 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 it's names that are inserted there, but it will be the, the, the most advanced weaponry in the world in the Battle of Armageddon. Yes. And uh, this is Satan's fell swoop, so to speak. And he is going to destroy these people once and for all. All of this we're seeing and have seen is a prelude to what's going to take place. The hatred that's there. He will have the greatest army the world has ever known and will have weaponry. That's a reason that no earthly army could defeat him. Israel will come down to the very edge of being totally destroyed. And they would be destroyed totally and completely because that will be the ambition of the Antichrist to do what Herod and Haman and Hitler could not do. And he will come close to doing it. But, but for the second coming of the Lord. Yes. Amen. And, and then the Antichrist has never seen war like war is going to be. And uh, we'll get to it in a, in a millennium sometime here, but uh, Ezekiel tells us how that the, the Lord will fight this battle. And um, there won't be any Antichrist left when it's over. And most of his army will be, not all, but most will be destroyed. It'll take months to bury the dead. That's how many that it will be. But this thing is going to conclude in the second coming of the Lord. I want you to think about that. That means we're close. It's going to conclude. What we're seeing on our television screens now as it regards what is taking place in Israel. It's, it's a prelude to what is going to happen in the very near future. Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. Mm -hmm. Praise God. And these are his people. And he, he, he doesn't like it at all whenever the church is persecuted. He doesn't like it at all when Israel is persecuted. And uh, I, I know I, if, if you rip out, talk about Israel is no more, you pull out all the chapters in the Bible that pertain to Israel's restoration, you won't have much left of the book. And uh, I don't see how the people can come up with such doctrines. Well, one of the statements they made in the video I was watching, and these are the, some of the biggest lights in Reformed theology, and one of them made the statement, the reason why I cannot accept dispensationalism is because of the question, what do you do with the epistles? I don't understand. That's what I said. What? His point was that all of Paul's epistles eradicates Israel. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. How in the world do they get that? Uh, what? Misinterpreting Ephesians whenever Paul is uh, emphasizing that now in Christ there's a new man, there's no Gentile or Jew, but we're all in one we're all one in christ there's no more enmity between god and man and now there's no more enmity between each other but there's a new man but that doesn't negate god's plan for israel because we don't say that israel bypasses salvation through christ nobody does jesus is the only way to heaven 
but these events that are unfolding specifically are about the redemption, what you described, how the nation of Israel will almost be brought to complete annihilation and God will rescue them, that Jesus will rescue them in the second coming. And so it's like that's what they're, that's what they're talking about completely, that when, whenever Christ died and gave us, Paul revealed it to us, the new covenant, then that replaces all of Israel with the church is what their mentality is. So it's, it's misappropriating or misunderstanding what it means that now there's no Jew or Gentile, but we're all one new man. Well, I've asked this in weeks past. I'll ask it again. Is that very widespread, that teaching? It's, well, like Brother Donnie said, I mean, among charismatic Pentecostals, it, it's, you know, it, it's not. They have a traditional view, but in scholarship— it is widespread that if you have a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial view of the end times, then you're considered old-fashioned or you're just considered unlearned or, or you know, if you have this what they call left-behind mentality, they, they scoff and they mock how we think about the rapture and the tribulation. So it's considered to be, you know, you're not as learned or you're not as intelligent or academic so it's widespread in the world of academics. Church-wise, it's mostly uh, like the reform camp, like he's talking about. The, the, the audience, reform means they're Calvinists. That's what reform theology is, Calvinism, which means no free will. Man does not have a free will that God has pre-selected who will be saved and who will go to hell. And the sinner that's been selected has no choice. It's called irresistible grace. I'm trying to ex explain what we're talking about to the audience because I see some, some of y'all looking funny looks on your face. So that's Calvinism. That's your Presbyterians, uh, a large portion of your Baptists, not all, but some. But they also, they're not only, uh, the, the leading lights are not only anti-Israel in Calvinism, but they're anti-Pentecostal. I mean, vehemently so. I mean, the, the, the language they use, I would say, is borderline blaspheming the Holy you Spirit. You mean they don't like me? No. They don't like these. <laughs> no, they're, not. they're, they're, they're uh, cessationists. They, like they, they don't they're like any Pente cessation. Pentecostals, according to them, are the cause of every problem in the church. Yeah. And that That's interesting. And Pentecostals are either demon-possessed or mentally deficient. That's what they say, openly say. There, there is a second thought about the, the word reformed and it means and I've heard it among their camps a return to the word and oh, yeah, um, the interesting the interesting truth is, is as was just pointed out the doctrine of dispensationalism came from that camp so and we adopt that view so there would be no Pentecostal movement if it wasn't for the reformed community now where it's branched off today um, it was a return to the word in, so in the 15 and 1600s yeah. Yeah. that yeah. spawned a hunger for more, which was, and we have to give credit to that because, mm -hmm. again, no dispensational view without them. And um, it, 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 we need to, you know, not have a Pentecostal view or a uh, reform view. We need to have a biblical yeah, but view. I, I, and so I, the word ref reform can mean return to the word. And I think we need the same yeah. thing today as they had in the 15 and 1600s. Well, but no, I, I, I would, I don't, I don't agree. <laughs> I, I don't agree. Uh, they, they, the reform theology has been the greatest deficit and the greatest hindrance from, in the word of God, to the work of God. I, I agree, but again, in the, amongst the camps, as Charles Spurgeon, you know, he was a four-point Calvinist. He, yes. He didn't... Um, but actually, he was a three and a half point. Three, three and a half. And so I think, I think it would be good to point out that they don't all agree. But, but, uh, but the ones that are the voices today do agree. They are in total agreement of the five points of Calvinism and cessational doctrine and all of that. But, but the, the, the pioneers of Pentecost did not come from a reform camp. 
that that did not have that much of an influence on them. They yeah, they came from the Methodist, That's the right. Methodist camp, the Holiness. Wesleyan, That's the right. Wesleyan Holiness. Holiness, which came from the Reform no. camp. Well, that, I, I no. mean, in, in 1517, the Magisterial Reformation, what Martin Luther kicked off, we do owe a debt because they got us out of the Catholic Church. Right. They began to emphasize. Salvation alone, scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone. So, so we would not have a Protestant church without Luther, without Zwingli, without Calvin, without Menno Simmons. And then from that, then we have people like Jacob Arminius, who was the forerunner of Arminianism that became Wesleyanism, that became the Methodist church, that became the, the Pentecostal the church. The Pentecostal church traces its roots to Arminius. Yeah, that's 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 yeah, Jacob, where we go Jacob back Arminius to. Not, not was, to uh, not to reformers, but but Arminius was reformed, and he set out to try to tweak Calvinism, wound up refuting Calvinism. Yeah, so was, it, in but, a in a sense, you go back to 1517, the Reformation changed the world. So that was the reform group. So it is true in a sense, but over you know what we evolved over time with Wesleyanism, holiness, Methodism, you know, that, that was people taking doctrines and, and, you know, tweaking them and realizing that's how we got to the point we are. So we do our ancestors we owe our, theologically. We, we is, owe our... We well, look, let me ask a question here. A person who believes full bore in, in Calvinism all of the points, whatever right that point. thing is. Can that person be saved? I, I think yeah. they are, but I think that I would vehemently disagree with the five points of Calvinism, particularly the L of the tulip, limited atonement, that says that Jesus only died for the elect, not for the entire world. The Bible says in Second Peter chapter 3 that it was... God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So that's what I have the biggest problem with in Calvinism is that a person can be born, live their life, die, go to hell, and never have any choice. I think that free will is demonstrated all through the scripture, and I don't see that in the nature and the character of God, that God would create someone and never have a choice, and they're going to spend eternity in hell. That's my biggest problem with Calvinism, but to Joseph's point, the Calvinists, they, they have a high view of Scripture. They believe in inerrancy. They believe in infallibility. They, you know, they believe they're trying to do right, but we obviously disagree with them. Some of them are civil. The seminary I went to, they were Calvinists. They treated me very civilly. They disagreed with me. Like Brother Donnie said, they're, they were anti-Pentecostal. They were anti-women preachers. I mean, they have very strong views about a lot of things, but they were always very civil. Some of them are not that civil. Some of them are very arrogant, and they are definitely against what we do, what we're about. So, I mean, it is, you know, it is destructive. In, so, in some instances, the hyper-Calvinism is very destructive. S but some would say that hyper-Wesleyanism could right. be very destructive. Suffice to say, you know, people will shoot at us because you quote Arthur Pink in this book, and uh, he was a Calvinist. Yeah. And no, my point that. is just yes. simply this. Uh, we, we need to if stop. If he told the truth about something. If, if, they're return if we are forced or they're encouraging us to the degree they encourage us to return to the Word and get our views formed and shaped by that, yeah. But they twist the word. Here's the problem. You can scream all day long, we're students of the word, we have to turn the word, but they misinterpret the word. Yeah. But and so well, what do they do with whosoever will? Let him come and take the water of life from They would well, say that that's just the elect. Yeah. Well, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll say well, only the elect will will. It would probably help some of the folks who are listening if we explained what the five points were of Calvinism. We, we all know what it is, but there are probably people who don't. The five points of Calvinism are generally called the tulip, which is total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and preserva preservation of the saints. 
And that, basic, that's their doctrine. That's their doctrine. That's Calvinism. All of Calvinism and the Reform movement is built on those five statements. And to Dr. Watts, what he is saying, if you're a Calvinist, all of those apply to those who are called to be elect. They believe in predestination, and some will say that they believe in a double predestination, that some are predestined for heaven while others are predestined for hell. Well, to me, there's no double predestination. If you're predestined to hell... No, no, say, say that again, please. <laughs> some, there are some extremists who believe in what's called double predestination. How in the world can that be? Well, it can't. Well, it's a mute point. Unless unless you're, if, if some are predestined to go to heaven, Everybody where are the rest going to? Yeah. You know, the, the, you asked the question, could, could they be saved? Uh, let me ask another question. Do they think we're saved? Oh, no. No, 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 no. no, no, no. That's the key saved. thing. But here's so the thing. How in your situation, they're polite, but when push comes to shove, Calvinism doesn't think that any one of us are saved. Well, I think that, Joseph, there's a point that, you know, it's like Pentecostalism. You can't brush a broad stroke. There are degrees within the movement, so there are hyper-Calvinists, and there are those yeah, there's that three are, points, two three, points. It's kind of points, like yeah. Pentecostals. There right. are those that are, you know, there's a lot of different versions within that term. And I'm not, trust me, I'm not standing up for uh, Calvinist. I had to... Uh, defend myself being the only Pentecostal in my cohort and the only one that supported women preaching and the only one that was, supported the nation of Israel, the only one that supported dispensationalism. So I'm not defending them, but I am saying we do owe gratitude because of the Magisterial Reformation, 1517, the return back to Christ alone, Scripture alone. This is what got us to where we are. So in a sense, what what you're saying is, is correct, but also there have been a lot of things that have been destructive. I had one hyper-Calvinist told me that uh, Jesus looked into the future and aligned his teaching with the teaching of John Calvin. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the kind of thing we're talking about well, here. Their God is, their God that's, is that's, John Calvin. That's it. The God is, they worship Calvin more than they worship they do. Jesus They know Christ. more of his book, the Institutes of Christian Religion, than they do in the Scripture. Well, I'll just close it with this statement. I believe Calvinism is a tool of Satan, and it is one of the most debilitating evil doctrines in the church today. Can I add one thought? John Calvin wasn't saved. Hey, I agree. I agree. <laughs> well, I will, I will say this, changing a little bit of the dynamic here. <laughs> I, was, I was invited in 2020 by a group of pastors to the White House. And I went. I was the only Pentecostal among the group. There was about 25 of us. And they were all belonged to the Southern Baptist Convention. And I knew that going into this. I knew that I was going to be like a fish out of water. But when I walked into the hotel and there was the group of pastors that were there, every one of them knew who I was. Every one of them knew exactly who I was. And there was a pastor from North Carolina. I'll never forget it. His name is Pastor Sexton. Pastor to church, a Southern Baptist church in North Carolina. He was greeting all the other pastors. When he came to me, he stopped and broke down, started crying. He said, Brother Gabe, I need to tell you something. And all these pastors are looking at me. And he said, I'm Baptist. I think everybody in here knows that we're all Baptist but you. But I need to tell you something. My wife died about six months ago. She died of cancer. But she was an avid viewer of Brother Swagger. She watched the telecast, the network, religiously. And she said, and he said, you, speaking to me, she said, you were her favorite. And she told anybody that walked into the, to the house, 
shut your mouth. My boy is on TV. <laughs> he said, I wanted to tell you what your grandfather's ministry has meant to my family. And after that, another pastor came up to me and said, you know, I've got a story too. When I was in prayer one day, he said, I was just in prayer and seeking the Lord. And all of a sudden, the song came to my mind, let the blood of Calvary speak for me. Amen. And I started to quote that first line. He said, and I couldn't remember the rest. And I flicked on the internet and I tried to find the lyrics to that song. And he said, your grandfather's video of him singing that song pulled up. And he said, I automatically shut it off and said, I don't want to hear anything by that man. But he said, the Lord spoke to me and said, if I can cover him, I can cover you. He said, if the blood of Calvary can speak for him and every other person, he can speak for you as well. And he said, I have to tell you, Gabe, that moment changed my mind about you and your family. He said, I'll watch y'all. I mimic everything y'all do. And he said, I'm, he said, next time when I'm in Baton Rouge, I'm coming to your church. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to turn into a Pentecostal. <laughs> So there are, we may disagree on some things, but ultimately, if they are a part of the family of God, we are too. Amen. And we need to look at them as brothers and sisters and realize that even though we might have disagreements, all families have disagreements, but ultimately, we're going to the same place. Well, you and your dad was with us, of course, whenever we went to uh, Dr. Dr. Stanley's, Dr. Stanley's home going. His, 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 uh, yeah, memorial service. It's a celebration service. I couldn't have asked for people to be more kind, mm -hmm. more gracious. And uh, I don't mean, uh, I never felt a single arbitrary spirit. They swarmed you to the point where it was almost suffocating. Right. How right. much that they were around you and how much they were right. around us telling yeah. us, we watch y'all. And how many were saying, we belong to First Baptist Atlanta, but we're media members of Family Worship Center. <laughs> yeah. Brother Swagger, I think, too, we owe a debt of gratitude to a man named Kenneth Weiss. Yes. yes. Who was in that camp. And uh, I, don't, I, don't think if, I don't think we would be here today as a church if it wasn't for his effort to return to the Word and dig into the Scriptures. He was wrong. Uh, about many things uh, around the Calvinist uh, discussion, of course. We don't agree with that. But, but he was not a five-point Calvinist. Kenneth Weiss was not a five-point Calvinist. Um, I became good friends with John R. Rice, and um, he was not a five-point Calvinist either. And he was bitterly opposed to Pentecostalism, but he started changing in his letters. <laughs> and uh, um, he was playing one of my tapes on the plane somewhere that they were going. Some of his compatriots, you know, what are you doing listening to that? He said, because I like it. <laughs> and uh, like Gabriel said, some of those people love the Lord very much. Absolutely, yes. And... Uh, um, we have to let the Lord handle the rest of it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound of oh, that saved a wretch well like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to feel and raise my feelings
We hope you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call 1-800-288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.